I got a lot of news today, actually. It's uh, it's going it's blazing up all of the news channels and some interesting news at that. So today we're going to talk about uh, not only economic news, but we're going to talk about some specific things in the housing department uh, that's going on. First, we're going to start with the national economy. Today, they announced that the National Pers uh, Producer Price Index, the PPI, Producer Price Index, dropped uh, last month for the first time unexpectedly. Everybody had projected that this would go up. Now, the PPI is the precursor to the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. The CPI is the thing upon which they base inflation. So you have the producer level and then they sell the products and the consumers pay for it. At the consumer level is where they judge inflation. They just determined though today, yesterday, and it came out this morning, that the PPI has actually dropped for the first time, I think in about four or five years uh, since 2019 was the last time that it dropped. Um, so it has gone up continuously. So that is an extremely good sign, unexpected. Um, and the main reason that it dropped is because of energy prices. So um, you guys have probably all seen at the gas pumps that gas and diesel are coming down. There's lots of talk out there in the, uh, you know, in all of the, the chat rooms about the fact that this is being government manipulated. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, more if it's a real supply demand thing. I, I tend to think it's more supply demand. Prices got so high, people just don't drive anymore. Uh, at least it looks that way when you're out driving around. But nonetheless, that has driven down the PPI. Takes about a month or two, depending on what types of goods and services are out there for that to filter through to the CPI. The bottom line though, is this alone makes a possibility that next year, we will actually see interest rates trend down instead of up. Now, they've never talked about that until the last couple of days, that there is a possibility. And even today, uh, some leaks out of the Fed said that they may only increase this next go round in September uh, to 50 basis points from 75, what's the projected, what the market is built in. If that happens, uh, that will drop interest rates very quickly because people have priced in the 75 basis points increase in the next uh, Fed funds rate increase. Uh, that's item number one. Number two, unemployment expectedly went up. Uh, they were expecting it to go down. Uh, they thought there was more jobs being created. There's actually less jobs being created. And there was more pink slips given uh, last week. So uh, once again, a little bit of a surprise. Um, and that once again will also indicate that there's going to be need for a, a reduced interest rate. Now, you know, the, the actual need for it and when it happens is different. It was needed. We needed to, to raise interest rates a year ago. We didn't start raising them until just a few months ago. So the Fed ha has, at least for the last year or two, been kind of late to the party and then kind of ruined the party when they got there. And so, you know, there's going to be a clear indication, I think, here, especially with this next uh, item we're going to look at, which is GDP. Uh, there is a clear indication that the Fed needs to look at sometime in 2023 rates for interest being dropped. And I think they probably will, uh, maybe the second half of the year, this time next year, you'll probably see interest rates start to go down. Go to, they'll go up in the meantime, they'll start to go down, unless there's other more bad news from an economic standpoint, and there could be. Now, GDP also yesterday, they announced that that went down. They were not expecting that. That's the third uh, kind of triple whammy in a row that was being unexpected. The, the GDP is the total um, goods and services value of everything created during the month. And this is what they measured, the monthly GDP. And it went down from the prior month, from June, it, it actually went down. So what that means is there was less stuff being bought and sold across the board uh, than there was the prior month. It, it doesn't necessarily factor in only the, in, the inflationary pressures, it factors in the actual numbers of goods and services consumed. It went down, it was expected to go up. So these are all big indicators that uh, the economy is sinking and it's sinking a lot faster. They expected these things to happen, but over a period of about six to eight months. Instead, they all happened during the month of July. So you know we, we'll see some response here coming up in the next few days. Everybody should keep their eyes and ears open. Um, now, what does this mean for us in the housing business? That's uh, something that we really need to look at. So there was an article that came out today as well. And 
uh, once again, you know, thanks to Moody's and some of the analysis that they've done, they looked at, uh, there's about 800 or 900, approximately eight or 900 markets um, out here in this country, 917 is the actual number, um, that are measured on a, for the housing in the, as MSA statistical areas. And these things are measured from a month to month basis to see you know, how are prices going up? Are prices going down? Is inventory going up? Is demand going up? Or, or are those things going down? And so what they determined was last month, there were literally 20, 57 of those 917 markets that went up over 200%. Now, this is inventory we're talking about. So if there was 500 homes on the market in, you know, East Overshoe, Iowa, MSA, um, to go from 500 to 1,000 on the market is 100% increase. To go from 500 to 1,500, it's it's a doubling or 200% increase. So in 57 markets in one month time, they, they had a 200% increase. The worst markets, surprisingly, there was a number of them that were over 300%. So in other words, 500 homes on the market in June, 2,000 plus homes or 2,500 in July, that's a huge number. It's beyond a, any one month record ever they've seen. So in other words, inventory bumped up huge amounts. Literally 898 out of 917 markets from June and July, from June to July, uh, went up inventory wise. In other words, the inventory increased uh, significant amounts. The, the worst places in the country, the top five worst places Salt Lake City, fifth uh, biggest increase in inventory during the month of July. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, Provo, Utah, and then Ogden, Utah, 372% increase in inventory. Idaho Falls, Idaho, 387%. So a almost a four-fold increase uh, added on to the existing inventory. Uh, what's this doing? <clears throat> well, uh, and, and by the way, it's, it's becoming the worst in the Mountain West, Southwest, and Southeast portions of the U.S. So Idaho, Utah is considered the Mountain West. Southwest would be Arizona, uh, Oklahoma, uh, New Mexico, and Colorado in that, that general area. Southeast, of course, is Florida and the Carolinas, um, Georgia, and, uh, Alabama, Louisiana, those markets. So <clears throat> these are the ones that are that are increasing inventory the fastest. In addition to this increase in inventory, um, we're seeing a decrease in demand. Why is that? Well, we've talked about that for uh, several months here. When interest rates go up as high as they've gone up, people just can't afford to, to uh, get these houses. Now, what I'm seeing out here um, is you're going to, see, I'm going to make a few predictions here, what I think is going to happen over the next year and a half. And this is why it's probably, uh, I said this is one of this kind of golden window where you need to be looking to buy inventory and accumulate inventory and flip inventory and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to double down on that. I'm going to say this is probably the best time I've ever seen. And here's why. The inventory has gone way up demand from buyers has gone way down. That's a, that's a realistic demand. In other words, there's buyers who can actually afford to pay 6% interest to buy homes. The real demand is expanding dramatically on a monthly basis because there's still the same number or more people who want to own a home, but just can't afford it. Only about 30% of the people who could afford a home in January can afford a home today to buy. So that we've lost 70% of the buying market. Combine that with inventory going up, prices are dropping, uh, but I don't think they're going to drop as fast and as far as they did in 2008. That's my first prediction. I think we're going to see a slower deflationary thing, except in the most overvalued markets. The most overvalued market in the U.S. Uh, currently is, uh, Salt, is Boise, Idaho. Uh, you have Salt Lake City. You have Austin, Texas. You have Phoenix. You have Las Vegas. These are some of the most overvalued markets. You can expect bigger drops in those markets. I think in a lot of the areas of the country, you're going to see more modest drops, but you're going to see more desperate sellers. And uh, that's going to at least appear on the surface to these sellers as a, you know, all rats need to leave the sinking ship event. You're going to be able to buy huge property 
profitable properties, huge amounts of profitable properties going forward, uh, you know, if you know how to do it, of course, and that's what we teach, but there's going to be huge opportunities in less than a year's time uh, to make hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on properties if you position yourself just correctly and you keep your eyes and ears open. The demand for the buyers is not going away. So if what happens, and this is my second prediction, sometime next year, uh, the Fed's going to drop the interest rate. When that happens, buyers will mentally run back to the marketplace. All these ones that are sitting on the side. Remember, the big upturn in the markets, demand and actual buyers and, and prices going up was caused by this artificial having to sit on the sidelines during COVID. Wouldn't let people go look at houses for a long time there. You couldn't you show houses, all that kind of stuff. The buyer demand built up, built up, built up. And then it started getting really, people started buying and there was less and less buyers. You know, we got down to people who got a little late to the party. Now that buyer pool is building, building, building and the supply pool is building. So like we said, if you can ever get yourself, you know, even a one once in a lifetime event where you've got a lot of supply, it's cheap, there's a lot of profit in it and you got a lot of buyers, you, you can write your own ticket. You just need to do what you got to do to get to that point. So there are several ways you can make sales now by virtue of, we've talked about this before, you can buy down points so you can create a more profitable loan environment for your buyer. You could buy properties and lease option them out. And a year or two from now, when I think my prediction of lower interest rates comes, these buyers will be able to get a loan and rebuy or buy those properties from you. You'll be able to do that. Or you could turn right around and flip them now and either keep them as a rental or sell them. Uh, you know, at there are buyers out there who can't afford the 6%, uh, and, but they are picky. They want the top quality stuff. In other words, think of uh, flip this house, flip or flop. Any of those shows out there on TV where the thing looks like a Taj Mahal when it's done. It's beautiful. It's travertine floors and Italian marble countertops and all that kind of stuff. If your house looks like that when it's done, that'll sell just like that. You'll be able to sell it at or above, uh, my belief, uh, your asking price and the market price will sell at the higher end of those things. So um, there is a, there's a window here probably of a year or so when it would be a good time to, if you can, to accumulate properties um, and then either put them in a short-term rental fleet, lease option them out, or as I'm doing with one of my housing business, you just flip these things right now. Just get them out there, make them look great, and you put them on the market immediately and they get sold quick. Uh, but either way, and, and then you, of course, there's the creation of the finance product, the creative finance environment where you can attract these buyers out there. But this is going to be probably, and this is my third prediction, this will be the best uh, probably housing market for investors who stay in this market, at least in the last 50 years, maybe the last 80 years, maybe since the end of the Second World War. I don't think there's going to be a better time because I don't think prices are going to drop as much as expected. I would project maybe a 15% national drop. Could be worse. Depends on what happens nationally, internationally. Uh, and if things like the gas price are really being manipulated or uh, if it's a, a true market demand and supply issue. Um, if, if all of these things are above board and they're happening as they appear to happen without some interference from you know, the man behind the curtain type deal, um, this is going to be a write your own check. You're going to be able to work for the next year or two and then you never have to work again. So keep your eyes and ears open. We tell you on these calls five days a week how to do this. Um, we, we literally are doing exactly what we're telling you to do. Uh, Blair and I are buying houses. Uh, my other teams, we're buying houses. We're, we're literally just doubling, tripling down on what we can get, what we can buy. Uh, because I think the long-term value here, even in a shorter window, is tremendous. All right, that is news you can use for today. I'm sure by next Tuesday, we'll have all kinds of new things come. As we get closer to the election, you're going to see other things that are going to go up and down and funky, unusual things that we're not expecting. Uh, some of that will be manipulated. Some of it will just be happenstance. So uh, we'll try and kind of divine the tea leaves for you and tell you where we think things are going.